Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joey's Ventures, and today we're going to be doing part 39 of our uh, Planet Zoo Mod Spotlight, so we take a little bunch of different cool animals that people have been making. So we've got a really interesting selection here today, we've got a bunch of different uh, birds and a bunch of different mammals, a bunch of different, all sorts of different things. So yeah, we've got two more parts really coming until um, the North America pack comes out, so we've got to make sure that we get them out as ASAP. So they don't crash our game. So yeah, let's get stuck into this one. So we're going to be starting off with um, the Crested Ibis by Ron Mayron or Rihanna, everyone's favorite bird maker. So we're going to have a look at the Crested Ibis here. Really, really wonderful animal here. So the Crested Ibis is also known as the Japanese Crested Ibis or the Asian Crested Ibis. It's a pretty large bird. They're generally about 78.5 centimeters or 30 uh Point nine inches long. They've got this white plumage and also uh, are native to the pine forests of Eastern Asia. And you can see its head's uh, particularly bare. And you can see this red skin showing through here. As, and they have these large white plumes or white feathers down the nape. They give them their name, the Crested Ibis. Um, and they look really, really wonderful, don't they? So these guys are really, really interesting. So these guys were found in, um, were native to the Russian Far East, Japan, and mainland China, and was a non-breeding visitor to Taiwan and uh, the Korean Peninsula, but uh, now disappeared from most of its former range, as it is endangered, and uh, the only natural population occurs in Sangxing, China, sadly. Still really wonderful animal regardless, so these guys have a diet of pretty much whatever they can find. They've got a seafood diet, you could say. They eat a lot of frogs, uh, small mammals, uh, small fish, small just basically any small animal, really. And as for nesting, as you can see the cute little babies here, they nest in uh, the tops of trees on top of hills, so that gives them an advantage to obviously avoid predators. And these usually overlook their habitat, so really, really wonderful. But another sad fact about these guys is these guys are uh, the last wild crested ibis in Japan who died in October 2003 until they were reintroduced into 2008, I believe. And um, the remaining wild population was found only in the Sanctuary province of China until the reintroduction of captive birds back into Japan. And they were previously thought to be extinct until they were rediscovered in 1981, where there was extensive breeding programs, especially in captivity, to uh, bring these numbers up. And there was, uh, in 2002, there was a total of 130 colonies of these guys in China. And Northwest Sanctuary Province Refuge Center has, uh, has, has a history of 26 uh, Ibris fledglings, so they brought them back up to help them bring their numbers up. And they both, through artificial and natural incubation, created 26 uh, babies. And um, on July 1st, uh, 31st, 2002, five of the seven chicks were hatched in an incubator in the center of Northwest Sanctuary Province. And this was the highest number of chicks ever recorded to hatch, and which is pretty awesome. And the parents uh, for the chicks were chosen from 60 Ibis pairs reared at uh, captivity uh, at the research center. So the really big issues for these guys are ongoing habitat loss, small population sizes, uh, limited ranges, winter starvation, and persecution has brought them through the 20th century to the brink of extinction, and they are listed as endangered by um, the IUCN and are Appendix 1 by CITES. So luckily there have been uh, captive breeding programs, especially in London, um, and in China, South Korea, and Japan. There have been breeding programs there, and have been reintroduced um, to places like Japan, especially in 2008. They introduced about 60 ibises in uh, 2015. And uh, this confirmed that there's been a small breeding population there that hopefully goes up. And also South Korea. There have been some uh, efforts to reintroduce uh, crested ibises. So yeah, a really cool species regardless. Again, made by Rodameon or Rihanna. One of our favorite bird makers. She really does make the wonderful birds. So now we're going to go on to another one of her birds. This is a little bit of an older mod, but still a goodie. We have got the Himalayan Monal. So let's have a look at this wonderful guy here. So these guys, also known as the Empyrean Monal or Empyrean Pheasant. There are pheasant that are native to the Himalayan forests and scrublands of elevations of uh, between 2,000 and 4,500 feet, or uh, meters, I mean, or 6,000 to 14,000 feet. And they, are and they are a type of pheasant. 
and the considered least concern, luckily. Also, uh, the national bird of Nepal and the state bird of Ukaratan, uh, India, where they're also known as just the Monel. So these guys are a pretty large pheasant. The bird is about 70 centimeters or 28 inches long. The male weighs up to 2,380 grams or 84 ounces and the female 2,150 or 76 ounces. Uh, ounces. And um, the adult male you can see here, he's an adult male, he's got these wonderful multicolored um, uh, coats along with these iridescent feathers. You can see there's like this greenish uh, uh, metallic green that you can see here. Also the coppery feathers on the uh, uh, bottom here. Also this purple and turquoise and all these really nice colors. They're really beautiful birds. But then you contrast that with the female. The female has a much more uh, drab color, but she still has a really nice pattern regardless. Helps with camouflage. So uh, the first year male and the juveniles represent the female, but then you can see as they grow up the males will become like this. And we'll have a talk about the females anyway. So for their breeding behavior, we'll uh, look at the babies. Look at this. Look at that. So these guys, the breeding season is about April through August, and they generally form pairs around this time. And in winter, they congregate in these large convoys where they roost communally to raise their chicks. And these species is least concerned, so they're considered doing very, very well. And in some, but in some areas, uh, there is threats of poaching due to people uh, taking their crest as sort of a status symbol of the wearer and a symbol of authority. That can be an issue. But also, uh, they have been uh, really severely affected by human disturbance, such as making hydroelectric dams and hunting pressures as well. But luckily, they are not considered endangered in most areas and are mostly doing fine for the most part. Another big issue is climate change, which may mean that they need to go up higher and higher in the mountains to find their preferred habitat. It's still really wonderful regardless. Let's have a look at the male for a minute. Really, really wonderful. Pretty beautiful multicolored. Um, they're one of my favorite birds, honestly. I love Himalayan Monels. So yeah, we're gonna move on from these birds, both done by Rihanna or Ron Mayron. Now we're gonna move on to a mod that was done by Leaf. We have got the Vervet Monkey. Who doesn't love a good monkey? So let's have a look at them. A little friends. So the Vervet Monkey, or simply known as just the Vervet, they're an old world monkey uh, that is found in Africa. And there are five distinct subspecies found throughout most of southern and eastern Africa. And they're also introduced to Florida and Barbados and Cape Verde, so they have been introduced in some places. They're also the mostly herbivorous monkeys, and you can see they have these black faces along with these uh, grey body hairs colours that can range. And they also range in body length from 40 centimetres in females to about 50 in males. And uh, really, really interesting regardless. And they get between the adult males can they, they exhibit sexual dimorphism where the males are larger than the females or vice versa and the males have which you can't see here they have like a turquoise uh blue scrotum so they got blue balls of course but i can't obviously the mod doesn't really show that off um the adult males can get between 3.9 to 8.0 uh, kilograms or about 8 to 17 pounds an average about 12 pounds or 5.5 uh, uh, kilograms and have a body length of about 420 to 600 millimeters or 70 to 24 inches and the average about 19 inches or 490 millimeters so these guys are very very social like a bunch of other monkeys so females will kind of remain in their groups throughout their lives but the females and there's separate dominant hierarchies for both the males and the females so there's a top male top female and the male hierarchies are determined by age and tenure fighting abilities, while the females are determined by maternal social success. So if you kind of have raised the most babies, you're kind of the top, pretty much. And obviously the highest ranking uh, individuals usually get the um, spoils, they get the best access to food and resources and things. And there's kind of a lot of competition within these groups. And these guys also are very very useful for other species uh they kind of have really strong alarm calls so when they see animals like baboons uh pythons eagles and leopards so they let out this alarm call that is often used by other species as well and they will use them to obviously call juveniles to them and <laughs> it's really interesting is that they also can be quite spiteful so it's a very rare thing to see in the animal kingdom 
and what they'll do is they've been observed taking a competitor's food and rather than consume it or steal it for themselves they kind of just do it out of spite so i think that's really really funny and for reproduction they don't really show any external signs of estrus but they will elaborate social behaviors will involve it so then what will happen is um the female will mate and the female gives birth once a year between se uh, september and february after gestation period of 165 days usually there's only one infant born at a time but twins can occur sometimes and a normal infant weighs about 300 to 400 grams or 11 to 14 ounces so really really wonderful let's find ourselves another there we are have a look at the baby really cute baby while we're talking about them so the diet of these monkeys is primarily herbivorous that so they live mostly on wild fruits flowers leaves seeds and seeds pods and they can become a problem in agricultural areas but they also have been known to eat a bunch of animal foods such as uh, grasshoppers and termites also uh, raid nests but they will eat the chicks and eggs of birds so a little bit of protein and um they're pretty much found across most of southern and eastern Africa and being found in South Africa, Ethiopia, Somalia, and around the East African Rim. And they've also been introduced into a bunch of islands such as Cape Verde, uh, Barbados, and Florida. They've also been a home of 40 introduced vermin monkeys. Let's see if we can find a female, what we're talking about. Is that it? There's a male. There's a female. She sees pregnant as well. Let's, let's go talk about her really really wonderful so these guys uh usually also used for biomechanical research uh biomedical research i mean and they live in many people live in close proximity with these guys and are considered pests since they steal food but they are heavy fines in a lot of areas discouraging people from killing these monkeys even though they're considered uh least concern and the species was also known from ancient Egypt, including the Nile Valley and the Red Sea Mountains. So it's possible that they may have been popular in the area, kept as pets, and maybe even lived in the area naturally and went extinct. Still really, really wonderful animals regardless. How can you not love a good monkey? So yeah, that's our vervet monkeys. So now we're going to move on to... This next one was done by Leaf and Nicholas Lion Rider. This one was just done by Leaf, the vervet monkeys. So we have got now the blue-eyed black lemur, which is very, very interesting. Really cool animal. So the blue-eyed black lemur, also known as the scarlet lemur, they are a species of true lemur that can attain a body size of about 39 to 45 centimeters uh, in length with the body and a tail length of 51 to 65 centimeters and a total length of about a meter long. And they weigh between 1.8 to 1.9 kilograms. And you can see, being a primate, they have these quite strong hands that allow them to climb around. They're some of the, they are very good climbers. And these guys are extremely sexually dimorphic, as you can notice here. You can see the males are these black ones here, and then the females are a much more reddish uh, color. Really pretty extreme sexual dimorphism. <laughs> really, really cool regardless. And um, they also get the name the blue-eyed black lemurs because of their bright blue eyes really really striking colors and they sadly have not been studied intensely in the wild but they have been known to live in social groups that vary from four to eleven individuals the females are dominant like in most lemur species and are usually more males in each social group uh, more males and females and they tend to be poly uh, polyamorous so the females will also give birth in june or july with after gestation about 120 to 20 129 days the young are weaned from the adults about five or six months old let's find a baby while we're talking about them very very cute regardless i think they're adorable and they reach maturity at about two years old and they may live up to 50 to 30 years in captivity but there's little data on their longevity in the wild since they're poorly studied and they're believed to be carthermal, so that means they are awake random different parts of the day, so sporadically. And they're occasionally nighttime activities, but they also that depends on the frequency of the moonlight. And like other uh, lemurs, they communicate a lot through uh, scent marking, vocalizations, and facial expressions. So both, female, both males and females will mark trees using the uh, anogenital glands. So they'll mark the trees, similar to like how dogs do. And they use all sorts of different chirps, barks, uh, clicks, and grunts to be able to communicate with each other. And they're also known to be highly aggressive. So they will be frequent in fighting between males and females of both uh, groups and in within groups and out groups, which is pretty interesting. 
We'll have a look at her females and we'll have a look, a look at her. So yeah, very aggressive species. And um, they also have been observed to commit advanticide against other species of lemurs in captivities. But, um, and it's usually uncommon though, but it's still like a known fact. It's really interesting. And uh, these guys inhabit, uh, inhabit primarily subtropical moist forests, both primary and secondary uh, dry forests in the north western tip of madagascar and their range kind of goes this is a very small range and humans have cut down sadly most of their habitat to clear farmland and they are nearly extinct in the wild they are considered critically endangered so uh there's believed to be less than a thousand individuals in the wild and are thought to remain due to slash and burn uh, agriculture which very much does suck and uh there's also a mild threat from hunting but mainly it's just the agriculture that's not really the agriculture, that's uh, the slash of burn agriculture that's really affecting them. Still a really wonderful animal. Sad they're in the state they are. It really is. But now we're going to move on to another cool animal. So this one was done by Leaf and Nicholas Lion Rider. The next one has been done by Gaboy and Janora Pizza. So this is the Kalfa Lishwe. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Really, really wonderful animal. So these guys are just known as the Lishwe or the Red Lishwe or the uh, Southern Lishwe. They are an antelope that is found in the West Island, wetlands of South Central uh, Africa. So these guys natively live around Botswana, Zambia, the Southeastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, Namibia, Angola, and especially around the Okavango Delta, the Kalfe Flats, and the Banguelo wetlands. And there's also been a single individual, a single leashway that was found along the Northern Territory in Australia in 2015. So that's pretty weird. So the leashway isn't a particularly big antelope. They get to about 90 to 100 centimeters uh, at the shoulder or 35 to 39 inches. And they weigh between 70 to 120 kilograms or 150 to 260 pounds. And you can see they've got quite a distinct pattern. We'll have a look at the baby while we're talking about them. You can see um, the males, uh, they've got these golden brown bodies with white bellies. Let's see if we can get the male to come up. And you can see the males are generally quite dark in color. You can see the darker back here and darker legs. But the general the hue varies between the subspecies. This is the Kafua Lishwe, so they are quite a bit darker. But you can see these long spiral horns in the male uh, that can be only found on the males. And the hindlands are somewhat longer in proportion than other antelope. So that allows them to uh, run along marshy soil. And we'll have a look at, talk about the female. You can see she's a little less uh, drab. But um, anyway. So there's for four different subspecies. This subspecies is the Kafiro Flats uh, Lishwe. And is found within the... A few flats in Zambia, so this is a particular subspecies. But uh, and also with reproduction, these guys will during the raining seasons of November to February, they will have uh, that's when they'll mate and they have a gestation period of about seven to eight months. And so the mature, majority of the calves are between born between July and September, and there also been hybrids with water bucks been observed. But these guys are luckily considered least concerned. They are quite common. Now, there is an extinct subspecies, the Roberts Leashwear, that was found in northeastern Zambia, but is extinct. But overall, they are doing well. Not so much issues there, but there could be issues if the, their habitat is obviously destroyed, um, which is a big issue in Africa with agriculture. Still really wonderful animals regardless. So, yeah, we're moving on through... Uh, that was done by Gaboy and Janora Pizza. Next, we're moving on to the Honey Badger by Level Wolf. A bit of a uh, flash from the past, really. Really, really wonderful look at this animal. So, this is the honey badger or the ratel. So, they are widely uh, found across Africa, Southwest Asia, and the Indian subcontinent. And are considered least concerned because they're so widespread. And they're so awesome. So, uh, these guys, uh, you can see, have these fairly long bodies. And they have quite a distinctive... Uh, counter shady you can see they've got like a quite bright uh white uh, back along with uh black uh underside which is really really interesting they also have pretty uh thick skin especially around the neck it's about six millimeters thick to uh adaption to help fight between coast pacifics 
and they are the largest terrestrial mustelids in Africa. So the adults will measure about 23 to 28 centimeters or 9.1 to 11 inches in uh, shoulder height and about 55 to 77 centimeters or 22 to 30 inches in body length with a tail of about 12 to 30 centimeters or 4 to 7 inches in females. So females are usually smaller than males. In Africa, the males weigh between 9 and 16 kilograms while the females weigh between 5 and 10 on average, so that's 20 to 35 pounds, or 11 to 22 pounds on average. And an average male depends on kind of where they live. They are the third largest known badger after the European badger and the uh, hog badger, and the fourth largest terrestrial uh, mustelid after, additionally, the wolverine. So the wolverine's kind of the biggest and baddest. So uh, the size also depends on their habitat. So in, the ones in Iran are slightly... Uh, have been reported there were three wild females uh, reported to be uh, 18 kilos uh, about the typical weight of wolverines and that shows when there's the right conditions they can get to quite big sizes so yeah let's let's have a look at the babies let's find another one we'll have a look at this one look at this wonderful lad so in the right conditions, they can get quite big. So these guys are mostly solitary, but have been sighted in Africa to hunt in pairs during the breeding season. They will use old burrows made by um, aardvarks, warthogs, or termite mounds. And are pretty skilled diggers, so they can dig tunnels and hard ground in 10 minutes. But they usually have one entry and usually only about 1 to 3 meters deep, with a nest chamber that's not lined with any bedding. And they're also quite notorious for, being, uh, for their strength, ferocity, and toughness. They've been known to attack animals, even repelling large predators such as lions and hyenas. And the uh, um, bee stings, uh, animal bites, really penetrate their skin. That's kind of their big thing. But they, um, most animals, even if they're buffaloes, cattle or horses, will introduce on their burrow, will like intrude on their burrow, they will attack them. But they have obviously been known to be hunted by animals such as lions, uh, rock pythons, Nile crocodiles and spotted hyenas have been known to kill honey badgers. And also they have a pretty uh, generalist diet. They actually have the least specialized diet of the weasel family next to the wolverine. They will eat pretty much anything. They'll raid beehives, they feed on insects, frogs, tortoises, turtles, lizards, eggs, rodents, birds, snakes, berries, roots, bulbs, and pretty much everything. Um, and some individuals have been actually observed to ca chase lines away from their kills. Uh, and they also feed on a wide variety of vertebrates, as I mentioned. Uh, in certain places they will feed, depending on what there is, some uh, populations will feed primarily on like geckos and uh, skinks. Others will feed on gerbils and mice. Uh, it really just depends on the local populations uh, of animals. Since they're so varied, it really just depends on the locality. And uh, in their relationship with humans is pretty interesting. They are serious uh, poultry predators, so people in Africa don't like them hunting their uh, poultry. And they're very, very difficult to be uh, for dogs to kill them. And they are kind of controlled. Uh, their skin is tough enough to uh, resist things like machetes and such. They uh, try to, obviously people try to um, avoid them as much as possible. But there are some parts in India as well. They live next to people's dwellings where they attack livestock, sometimes even children, uh, things like that. So you got to be very careful. And they're also a uh, main reservoir for rabies to other species. So that's another thing to be careful about. But another issue as well, but luckily they are considered least concerned because they have such a wide range and are so prevalent, there's no issues. Still a really wonderful animal. We all know honey badgers don't care, they just do what they want. Really lovely animals, I like honey badgers. So that was done by Level Wolf. The next animal we have got is a bit of a mouthful, but still a really cool animal regardless. We have got the Central African uh, Slender Snouted Crocodile by Leaf and Nicholas Lion Rider. So they are one of the two species in the genus uh, Mystrops, uh, or the slender salted crocodiles. So these guys are found in Central Africa, and the West African ones are found in Central uh, West Africa. So yeah, these guys are, are native to freshwater habitats in Central Africa. They tend to prefer highly vegetated bodies of water to hide and fi find prey. They're also medium-sized. They're typically... Oh, Gave a bit of a grump there. They are typically found um, around these areas. They're typically smaller, slightly smaller than an Nile crocodile, but they are larger than most other species of crocodilians that crocodilians that live in Africa. Adults typically get about 2.5 meters or 8.2 feet long, 
but they have been known to reach 4.2 or 14 feet long, and they range from weights between 125 and 325 kilograms, or between 276 and 770 pounds, with males being significantly larger than females. And you can see they're quite, uh, their slender snout, as obviously get their name, the slender snout crocodile, uh, is used for catching prey. And they are incredibly shy and adverse to human impacts, so that's a big issue for these guys. They tend to be more secretive. And the diet of these guys usually consists of fish, amphibians, and crustaceans, as you can kind of tell from its more slender snout. Uh, adults will also occasionally take larger mammals, uh, smaller mammals, uh, aquatic snakes, turtles, and birds, although that's not typically a huge thing. But um, both species also uh, can trust... The female will... Cons uh, make a mound nest where they make a plant matter and these nests can usually be about 50 to 60 centimeters uh, high and about one to two meters in diameter these nests are placed in the banks of rivers where they will begin when they start to lay their eggs at the beginning of the wet season and they kind of all breed in one go but they have a generally shorter season than the dwarf crocodiles and uh, they lay an average of about 16 to uh, but a minimum 13 maximum 27 very large eggs um, in about a week after completing the mound, where they'll incubate them over 110 days, which is long compared to other crocodile genera. And the average incubation for the females is 9 to 100 days, and the males usually 85 to 86 days, depending on the uh, sex of the babies. Once these eggs hatches, uh, they will emit their chirping, as you can see. And uh, a lot of these babies are lost due to predators, such as soft-shell turtles and such, but uh, they are minimal because the mother's around. And these guys are uh, temperature-dependent uh, species. That means the the sex of the babies are determined by the temperature, which is a big issue uh, with climate change as well. Females are produced at between 28 to 31 degrees Celsius, and the males are produced between 31 and 33. So the warmer it is, more males. The cooler it is, more females. The issue is if, if the world gets warmer, or the place where they live gets warmer, obviously you're going to make more males, which means they can't make as much babies. But the maximum temperature that these eggs can withstand is about 34 um, centimeters and uh, not centimeters uh, Celsius and produce females. And luckily, they are generally have great eyesight. And uh, let's look at the female we're talking about. Her. Look at these wonderful animals. Who doesn't love a great crocodile? They have good hearing, eyesight, and smell. And like other crocodiles, they have ISOs or integument uh, sensory organs, where they can pretty much like detect the movement of water around them. And they also have a third eyelid called a nectating membrane, which is present in many other reptiles, but is unique to crocodilians as being uh, semi-transparent that helps improve their eyesight when they're hunting underwater. And they're also able to make a bunch of different vo vocalizations like other crocodilians. They can be uh, hissing, growling, and bellowing, so that's very, very interesting. But uh, in terms of conservation, these guys have been studied very, very little, sadly, due to part to being in a remote habitat. The both the West African and Central African uh, species are classified as critically endangered because there are threats such as hunting, skin for skin and bush meat, uh, habitat loss, overfishing since they feed mostly on fish, and general disturbance has been known to impact them. They have been extirpated from uh, several different countries where they used to live, but however, they do remain. Uh, the Central African species, these guys here, retain a pretty robust population in Gabon. And it's considered unsuitable about the size of the population, but the estimates between 1,000 and uh, 20,000. And luckily they are kept in a bunch of uh, zoos, so there is a captive breeding program. So that works at least. Still really, really wonderful animals regardless. Now, can you not love a good crocodile? So done by Nicholas, uh, Lion Rider and Leaf. Next, we've got another big animal. This was done by Didims and Seth. We have got uh, the Southern Elephant Seal. Let's see if we can find it. Look at these wonderful guys. They're a bit small for uh, real life, but still really cool regardless. So the Southern Elephant Seal is one of the two living species of Elephant Seal, and as this one is the largest member. These guys get about 40% heavier than the Northern Elephant Seal, and twice the size as a male walrus. These guys get enormous. So. An average, a female uh, southern elephant seal will get between 400 and 900 kilograms or 880 to 1980 pounds and get between 2.6 and 3 meters long. 
But the bulls, they get enormous. The bulls can get between 22, uh, 2,200 to 4,000 kilograms, so about 4,900 to 8,800 pounds, so that's like 4 tons, and grow between 4.2 and 5.8 meters, or 14 to 19 feet in length. And um, these guys are much larger than the northern, the northern relatives. And uh, these guys, you can see they have these large uh, black eyes, they also have like a general, like quite um, black uh, skin and fur and things. And what gives their name the elephant seal, they have like this fleshy, uh, what would be the word? The word, they're kind of like, like a big fleshy uh, trunk, quote unquote. I'm not sure that's the right word. But they have these that they're able to use. They're very sexually dimorphic and then you can... Uh, so you can kind of use them, they use them to show off and make bellows and show that they're the biggest uh, boys around. And we can look at the females, we see if we can find the females. Where are they? Females are here, there they are, head in the corner. Females are not necessarily as extreme as the males, you see they don't have the big uh, trunks and they're quite a bit smaller. And you can see the babies, they're pretty much uh, dark, uh, they are born, here they're usually born completely black but um, this is a mod so doesn't really truly represent that still cool regardless um, they uh, range across the southern ocean so they can be found in where's the, where's the seal? cool cool animals so um, the world population is estimated to be about 650,000 in the 1990s the, the population of 2005 is estimated between 664,000 and 740,000 animals with three different populations within the southern ocean so the largest population is in the South Atlantic, uh, with about uh, breeding on South Georgia and the Falkland Islands. And there's other populations breeding in the Kirkland Islands, the Marion and uh, Prince Edward Islands and those kind of islands. But also the third population lives in the sub-Antarctic of the Pacific Ocean around the uh, south of Tasmania and New Zealand, including the sub-Antarctic New Zealand okay. Islands and uh, Australian sub-Antarctic Islands. But they have been obviously recorded often in uh, places like New Zealand as vagrants. And they actually used to breed there historically. So they would have uh, bred uh, before humans came and wiped them out. Which is kind of sad. But these guys uh, are very, very interesting because they have these extreme sizes because they maintain harems. So a male will have, like the beach master, will have a bunch of females that he will defend from other males that he meets with. That's why they get so big and um, defend. Uh, that's why they get so big to defend them, uh, their females from uh, the other males. So, and you can see these quite famous bullfights where they raise up and slap each other and get quite bloody. And the females uh, obviously hang out on land and they give birth to babies. Uh, the pups are generally born quickly during the breeding season, and the male, a uh, well, baby pup, can get. Um, weigh about 40 kilograms at birth, but can reach uh, 200, 120 to 130 kilograms by the time they are weaned. So the young uh, seals are usually uh, hang out in nurseries until they lose their birth coats, and then they enter the water to practice swimming until they can go out to the ocean. And another interesting thing about elephant seals is that they are some of the deepest divers, especially the deepest diving seal. They, um, they actually are the best performing diver. They can dive better than a lot of whales as well. So they tend to dive to depths of about 400 to 1,000 meters, or 1,300 to 3,300 feet, and the deepest diving non-cetacean. And a maximum depth has been 2,388 meters, or about 7,835 feet in depth. So that's the um, most deep they have gone. And they live out in the pelagic zones and the bethnic zones, uh, where they will kind of hunt for where they can. They will use partly their vision and the bioluminescence of their prey, to, and also their uh, whiskers or the verbiserae, where they use these, which are sensitive to vibrations that allows them to oh, yeah. find vibrations in the water to catch their prey. They mainly feed on a lot of mm -hmm. deep sea cephalopods, also a bunch of fish, krill as well, uh, other crustaceans, and even potentially algae. So that's pretty interesting. And the wean pups often fall prey to orcas, also um, attacked by New Zealand sea lions and leopard seals. Also great white sharks, uh, southern seabird sharks have been known to attack uh, ill uh, elephant seals. Even adult bulls have been attacked by orcas. 
Still really wonderful animals. Oh, there's an attack by orcas. So these guys were driven, driven to near extinction by the 19th century, uh, but their total population was estimated to be about 740,000 uh, in 2005. But most of their populations uh, were declining, apparently. Though there have been, there's still a lot of them, and there are still some good protections in place. And one big issue for these guys as well is climate change, since they are cop chop predators, they are most, sen uh, they are most uh, sensitive to the changes in climate. And it has been shows that they, since they are deep divers, they may have kind of escaped a bit of that. But also, uh, their population decline makes it harder and harder for them to find food. So, looking at these guys, they're a great indicator of how climate change is affecting the Southern Ocean. And uh, still really wonderful animals. I love elephant seals. So great. So, yeah. I think we'll be moving on to our last animal. So... That was made by Didums and Seth, and this last uh, last animal was made by Bubbly Wums or Jen and Leaf. We have got the Doll's Porpoise. Such a wonderful animal here. Let's see you go. Look at you, wonderful guys. So, the Doll's Porpoise is a species of porpoise that is endemic to the North Pacific and is the largest porpoise. Uh, these guys generally get about 7.5 feet or 2.3 meters in length and weigh between 700 and 370 and 490 pounds or about 130 to 210 kilograms and they have quite a prominent sexual dimorphism with the males being larger and you can see they kind of got this really cool coloration they're mostly black except for the tips of their flukes uh, the tip of their pectoral fin and kind of this big patch on their belly and also their pectoral fins and dorsal fins uh, have like patches of white. And the calves, uh, I don't think the calves are too small to notice, but the calves generally grayish coloration and tend to be born at about a meter at birth and they tend to grow quite similar uh, in speed. So the males and females will grow quite uh, similar in speed. They usually reach about sexual maturity about uh, three to five years old. And the size will vary between populations, but they get a maximum of about 210. The females usually get a max of 210 centimeters, and the males will grow up to 220 centimeters. Except for some large populations in the Otrusk Sea, where males can grow up to 239 centimeters in length. So pretty cool animals. So as I mentioned, these guys are found in North Pacific from the east coast of California. Uh, that's the eastern part. Um, all the way from uh, the west to the Sea of Japan. And it's still pretty interesting. So these guys are opportunistic predators. They live in uh, midwater. They're not very deep divers. They're, they've recorded diving to depths up to 94 meters, but will feed on all sorts of different things. They feed on crustaceans, krill and shrimp, uh, but this is not likely their true diet in uh, these guys. But they mainly feed on squids. And uh, these guys are also pretty social. They live in fluid groups, about two to ten individuals, so there have been um, groups of over a hundred, hundreds being recorded, as kind of like a big uh, aggregation. And um, they have a polygamous mating system where the males will compete for the females, and during the mating season, the male will select a fertile female, female and guard her to ensure that the baby is his. And when guarding, they may sacrifice opportunities to dive, to feed, and birth usually takes place during the summer, uh, of about and their gestation is about 11 to 12 months. The females give live birth about uh, every three years uh, Depending on the conditions and there's a life expectancy of about 15 to 20 years of the mortality is unknown So Dallas porpoises are also known to be prey for transient killer whales and have been obviously been seen eaten but are very very active swimmers and they're often um, Have a characteristic spray called a rooster tail that kind of like goes off their uh, dorsal fin and they often ride the bow waves of whales and boats so luckily these guys are considered least concern estimates estimates of these populations uh, over the globe is about over 100 million but we don't really know that's the estimates it seems that there's certain populations such as the alaskan population is about 83,000. Uh, the british columbia population is about 5,000. And there are two subspecies of the Dolls Porpoise. There's the dominant Dolls Porpoises and also the True, uh, Truey, that's their subspecies name, that live in Japan. So the Dali type live in Japan. Uh, the Dali type live everywhere, but the uh, Truey type lives just in Japan, I believe. So these guys, is, uh, 
as I mentioned, they are least concerned, but they are impacted by bycatch, like a lot of other cetaceans and marine animals. Also, uh, there's a big issue with um, harvest for meat in Japan, since a lot of people will eat them. There's about, in 1998, more than 45,000 Dallas porpoises were harpooned uh, for a quota. But luckily this is managed and um, also being criticized for being not sustainable. But luckily they are kind of trying to manage them. They are at least concerned, so there's not any too many pressing issues for their conservation. Another big issue as well is their pollution, such as a bunch of DCEs or PCBs which is accumulates in the blubber of these animals since and that affects their hormones so that can also re uh, result in calf death and also issues with their reproductive system so it messes with their hormones happens to a lot of cetaceans as well but luckily they are listed as least concerned but they are at risk like other species such as bycatch uh, pollution and being harvested so yeah still really cool animals regardless i do love our doors porpoises let's have a let's have a look at another one there she's they swim about they're going to swim about. Wonderful, wonderful animals. So yeah, I think this would be a great place to end the video. We got them all sorted. So yeah, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified when I upload anything. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye-bye.